after hauling a trailer to Cedar City, I reorganized and I've got a truck full to go to Denver. And in it, I've actually got some pieces of a cell antenna. I'll go out during the next break and get it and bring it in. It's a piece of foil pasted to a piece of styrofoam. Then they put the radome, the plastic that you see, over the top of that to protect it. But the return loss on these antennas is somewhere in the area of 18 dB or better. So the goal is, is that the system return loss for almost all the cell companies is an 18 dB and in the Northeast, in New York, New Jersey markets, for T-Mobile at least, it's 20. So you can tell now that if you're a tire hand doing work for T-Mobile, you better have it together. And they demand that and they expect it and they do get it. Most of T-Mobile across the country and Verizon will take 18s. Now, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go out now and sweep your antennas and I want you to sweep them to the very best you can get them but your broadband antennas are going to be in the area of 14. That's where it's going to be. And it's only going to be as good as your worst component. So if you want to sweep your antenna on the ground and get a baseline number for it, please do. I think that's a good idea. If you want to sweep your antenna or your transmission line with a load on the end of it, which I'm highly recommending that you also do before you put the antenna on it, you should get a 30. And I'm going to show you all those numbers. In fact, underline 30 in there too. I'm going to show you some more pictures as we go on. Because a transmission line with a load on the end of it, a perfect 50 ohm load, better give you around a 30. It's only when you add the antenna to it that it goes bad. Actually, I thought we've got, Marty and I went and found, we took a road trip one day and we found these waveguides that are in the, the junk heap, literally. And I thought, you know, this is really, the, this other one is smaller, but this one is easier. I thought, you know, this is really good demonstration. We just go get a bucket of water and pour it in the end of this and take this end off right here, you know, and just have it come out the other end. How better to illustrate the fact that this is really nothing. <laughs> I'm gonna talk about that later. But I, wanted, I want you to understand that the waveguide and the feed horn, the feed horn is nothing more than an extension of the waveguide. And it's the dish, and it, all it does is it's just like you could literally take a light. I could take the light on my clicker over there, I could shine it in here, and probably I would be able to see the light coming out the end of this waveguide. It depends upon how, what the surfaces are like on the inside, of course. I'd lose some. But the reality of it is, is the rules of parabola Parabolas is what defines this. I'll draw this out for you a little bit later. But if any of you have ever had all oh, second year algebra, maybe. I always stop right there and let you think about that. Or college, college algebra, perhaps. This is where they teach you about parabolas. And it's, that's, that's, parabolas have vertexes and focal points. And it doesn't matter, you can whisper into one, just like those people over there. I can hear those people over there talking from clear across the room if I go speak into a, a mouthpiece. They do this in the Discovery Museums. If you've ever been in the Discovery Museums, I took my grandsons there once. Their mother was ready to kill them, so I said, let's leave. You know how that goes. And um, we went to the Discovery Museum somewhere in Iowa. And they had a parabola, one in that corner of the room and one in that corner of the room, and it was about 40, 50 feet apart. And right at the exact point where this would be, they had a little circle. And the note said, whisper into this, and you can be heard clear across the other end of the room. And sure enough, it worked. And those two boys, you know, they were like 10 or 11 years old at the time. They thought that was the coolest thing. I thought, man, what a powerful teaching tool because this is exactly what's happening with radio waves. This thing is spaced exactly at the focal point and it hits the vertex of that par parabolic dish, which is nothing more than a piece of steel, right? Nothing electronic to that thing, it's just a parabola. But because of the way that focuses that energy, it's just like a laser light. And it hits that and comes off the face of that as a microwave antenna. So the moral of the story is, is when we are actually testing 
waveguides and feed horns, we have a very different experience than we do when we're testing a Yagi a piece of coax. And I'm going to show you those differences. All right, let's keep, let's keep moving forward because I want to get you on the test equipment here. So I've talked about the four, four tests. Now everything, this is, I'm going to go over this very quickly because I go on the belief, I don't assume anything here. And Tom, you made a really good statement during the break is, yeah, you're reminding me of things I learned 30 years ago was the, state, the general statement. And that's true. And that's why I like to do the review. So the goal here is that antennas, all antennas are based upon an isotropic radiator. And so if it radiates equally in all directions, then, then life is good. Well, this is like a quarter wave whip sitting on top of a truck, right? Anything else is going to have gain. So what is the number one way that we get gain in an antenna? Focusing it. I had a guy in Kansas City once. That guy had been in class with me for almost two weeks. I taught microwave one week, followed by a couple other subjects, and then RSI actually had me teach an antenna uh, safety class on Friday of the second week. They, they sold the class and I had people from all over come into the railway in Kansas City where I'd been and I just continued to teach for RSI that day. Well, at the end of the day, I had a student that had been with me from the railway for this full two week period of time. And he finally looked at me and he said, and we'd been talking about microwave antennas for three days, and he said, it finally hit me. There's no gain in that antenna. There's no amplifier in that antenna. All I'm doing is I'm refocusing the energy in that antenna. I says, yes. And that's exactly right. You're all on the same page there. So fundamentally, cell, just think of a cell antenna. Just think of a microwave antenna. But any time that you've got an antenna that's just a whip, the only way we're going to get gain is to add sections, like I was showing you before. Because otherwise, it's going to be a hairpin. It'll just be a folded dipole, and it'll have a gain of about one. Actually has a little more than one gain, about one and a half to two dB of gain. But virtually is isotropic. So the goal here is, is that can we measure it? No, as I said before. And so that's, that's not a big deal. But I want you to just make sure that we're on the same page. The cell folks, for example, use 45, 90, and in some cases, 120 degree antennas. And that's how they get their three sectors. T-Mobile and Sprint especially have gone, that, that you can always tell a T-Mobile site because their antennas are right out on the ends. They're right on the corners of the triangle. And they use 120 degree sector antennas. Well, 3 times 120 is 360. So that's, that's what they use. Then the, the Verizons and the AT&Ts that have had the 800-900 systems for years, they'll have several antennas along the same face. Those will typically be 45 degree antennas or less. There's some 65 degree antennas in there too. The moral of the story is we direct it this way. In microwave, the beam width is somewhere in the area of two degrees coming off the face. Very, very small. Virtually the same as this laser light right in here, which I'm not going to turn on for obvious reasons. But you get the message. So very, very small beam width. 